Hello, ARC family, all of you on YouTube, if you're watching on Facebook, glad to join me this morning. My name is Ashley Buckner. I'm one of the pastors at Atlanta Revival Center. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about the weapons of our warfare, spiritual warfare. You know, I've always liked war movies, you know, guns, bang, bang, shoot them up, swords, all that kind of stuff. Not really a fond, you know, fond of destruction and all those things, but that's just what I grew up with. These weapons we use in our spiritual warfare are not like real swords. They're, they're, they're spiritual. And we need to get the concept of what that means and how to use those things. So I want to share with you a little bit today about my experiences. And I want to give you the order that I kind of discovered the four main weapons that I have in my personal arsenal. And Pastor Vance has talked about these things sometimes as well. But these are the things that I have found helped me. Now, I, I grew up in church. And I learned about singing the songs and worship and praying. And that's, that was kind of like my, my beginning. But as a child, I didn't really understand what all that was about. You know, the, if 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says that our weapons are not carnal, which means they're not of the flesh, right? They're not swords and guns. They're, they're spiritual. We can't really see them. You can't wrap your hands around the hilt of the sword or pull an actual trigger. And it's for us to gain personal victory. We have these special weapons so that we can gain personal victory in our lives so that we can help other people gain victory in their lives. Or maybe you're called to the mission field. You need to learn how to use these spiritual tools, these weapons, as I'm calling them, as we all need to do. Now, in order of my experience, as I said, there was worship. Uh, my dad was worship leader in our church, so we always sat on the second row. You know, that's, that, that was our seat every Sunday. It was our pew. It didn't have our name on it, but it was our pew. That's where we sat. So I learned how to lead worship. I learned how to sing the songs. I learned that part of worship, praising God through singing, uh, worshiping God with song. But there's also other aspects of worship. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all of the Greek and the Hebrew of that, but basically worship is to lay prostrate before the Lord, to just humble yourself before the Lord in that way. It also means to serve God and man. Knowing that we're serving God when we do serve our fellow man. When you see someone in need and you give them a helping hand, you're serving not only that person, you're serving the Lord. Because it's only the goodness of the Lord that brings us to do that kind of thing, right? We also have to wait on the Lord. This is also a part of worship, to be still. Sometimes, you know, we may not know which steps to take. We may not know what the Lord is exactly telling us to do or, or if we even feel like we're hearing from the Lord. But there's those times when we just need to wait. And we need to stay in this, this place to where we're listening to what the Lord is saying. And, and I'm going to get more into that. But, but we're waiting on the Lord to give us something to do. You know, the Israelites, Moses in particular, told the Lord, I'm not going anywhere unless you tell us to move. Because if you're not with us, God, we're not going. All right? So there's that time that we need to wait. And it's all about living for the Lord. So it's a lifestyle. It's not just something that we come to do on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or Sunday nights or whenever there's a revival meeting or a gospel meeting or a singing or anything like that. It's how you position yourself to walk out your life on a daily basis. Okay? Uh, I had a lady tell me one time that, that she could do whatever she wanted and not have to fear God because God was in the church. And... In my mind, I wanted to respond to that a certain way, but I also knew that that was her thinking, and she really didn't understand that, you know, God just, just doesn't hold up in a brick building somewhere. He's not just standing around waiting in our church buildings for us to show up. He's everywhere all the time. And so our lifestyle has to be that, that we know God is with us at all times because that's what he says. I am with you always until the ends of the earth. So our lifestyle of worship is a lifestyle of service. It's a lifestyle of positioning ourselves before the Lord, waiting on him to give us direction and support. So remember that lifestyle. The next thing is the word, the word of God, the scriptures. Jesus is also the word, but we, all, we have to read it. You know, if it's just sitting on your, your coffee table gathering dust, you know, like everybody has those big giant Bibles, you know, that great grandma had and, and nobody ever really looked at it. It just kind of sat there and, you know, they made sure it was all pretty. Well, no, we have to crack that thing open and we have to get into those words. We have to read that, but not just read it. We have to read it, learn how to apply it. So we have to read it. We have to hear it. 
We have to speak it and we have to spread it and we have to understand it. You know, if, if I don't understand it, then I can't teach it and I can't help someone else understand it. I can't help someone else apply the, the, the guidelines that God has given us in his scriptures if I don't even understand it. All right? I can make things up and I might lead somebody down the wrong path. But I need to take time to meditate on that word. And, you know, sometimes it's taking a verse at a time or a chapter at a time and reading those over and over and over and over again until you get the understanding, not only of what it's saying, but how you're supposed to apply it in your life. Because if we're not applying it, it's just another good storybook, right? So we need to learn how to do that. So this is growth, all right? The seed is sown into us, the word, it's sown into us, but we have, we're the ones that have to help it grow. We're the ones that have to keep planting it in there, making sure it is planted in there. I know a lot of people that can quote scriptures, but they don't live by it. You know, I've, I've met a lot of homeless guys that can quote scriptures better than most preachers I've ever met, but they don't live it, but they just quote it. We need to go beyond that. We need to learn how to live it. We need to learn how to express it. We need to learn how to share it so that other people can start getting the victories that we're having. The other thing I learned early on was about prayer. You know, I was taught about prayer. Pray, you know, pray the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is a great prayer. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer of deliverance. Lord, lead me not into temptation, right? Forgive me of my sins as I forgive those of their sins. So the Lord's Prayer is a great place to start. And I myself have been in a place in my life when uh, I was so busted up and broken up, I didn't even know how to pray. And I went to the Word, and I used the Word to help me pray. I went to the Lord's Prayer. I went to the Psalms, and I made those my prayers because my mind was just so jacked up because of the things that I had, I had done to myself. And, you know, I thought I had pushed myself so far away from God that all I could do was go to the Bible and make those scriptures my prayers until I could start standing on my own and speaking out of my heart what I needed to speak. You know, Jesus told his apostles, pray so that you won't be led into temptation. Well, if Jesus told his future leaders of the church this, then we should pray too, right? So we need to be willing to pray. That's our communication with God. But it's just not about wordy prayers. It's not about repeating things over and over again. You know, the Lord also teaches us about faith, that when we pray for something, believe that it's been done. So there's this level of belief that has to come. And I'm going to get on that in the next thing. The next thing is fasting. Oh, everybody just turned everything off right then, didn't you? Nobody wants to talk about fasting. That means getting hungry, right? Fasting isn't fun. Uh, I really didn't know a whole lot about fasting was never really taught about fasting. You know, all I knew was that all these guys in the Bible had fasted at some point in their lives, and I didn't really know what that was all about until something happened in my life that drew me to fast. But Matthew 17 and Mark 9 tells us about Jesus fasting. Acts 10 verse 30 tells us about this, this Roman centurion named Cornelius. He wasn't Jewish. He wasn't Christian. He's just off living on wherever he lived, somewhere on the Mediterranean Ocean with his family, and he fasted and prayed, and his fasting and prayer cried out to God, and his offerings cried out to God, and God sent a prophetic dream to the apostle Peter, telling Peter to go to this guy Cornelius. And then Peter went, and Cornelius and all of his household got saved because of Cornelius' fasting and his prayers. God heard those things. Acts 14.23 tells us about the elders and the apostles fasting. Uh, Acts 13.2-3 tells us about the elders in the church fasting on what and how they should send out the apostle Paul and Barnabas. So fasting is an important thing, but what is it? It's part of that waiting process. It's part of that positioning ourselves and the fasting going without food, okay, going without food, is pushing down our flesh because our mind tells us all kinds of things. You know, I got to go mow the grass. I got to pay the bills. I got to do this. I got to do that. The mind pulls us into all of those things. But when we can stop and fast, and I'm telling you folks, even if it's just lunchtime, if you spend an hour, one, two, three times a week, you just spend an hour fasting, 
focusing on the Lord, getting into the Word, applying these, these things, the prayer, the Word, the worship, applying them in that time of your fast, I guarantee you, you will see some amazing things start happening in you because it's going to draw you closer to God. And you see, that's what I didn't really understand. The first fast I went on, and I'm not bragging about anything, uh, our family was in a really bad situation. And we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what the answer was. We were praying, you know, seeking the Lord. We needed God to show up in a big, big way. And I finally said, I'm going to fast. At that time, I thought my fast was going to convince God, you know, to do what we needed done. That was what I thought. So I went on my fast, and I don't recommend this kind of fast. If you do it for the first time, I, I did 14 days on water. God's grace was on that, and, and I was able to push through. But the entire time that I was working my job, uh, we were 1,100 miles away from all of our family members, and I'm working 80, 90 hours a week, and I'm fasting, and I'm just in this constant mode of prayer. Constant, I don't even know how I functioned in my job, but I just kept praying. I just kept praying. And you know what? God did come in. God came in and did exactly what needed to be done, but it wasn't because of my fast. It was because of our prayer. It was because there were hundreds, if not thousands of people standing with us in faith to see us get through this situation we came through. But after that fast, I realized something about me. My whole religious experience, my whole concept of religion, my whole idea of my spiritual walk changed. My relationship with the Father, my relationship with Jesus Christ all changed when I came out of that fast. And I did not want to go back to the way I was, the Christian I was before. And I was trying to be a good Christian, but there were things in my life that needed to be broken off. Now, after that fast, a new aspect of prayer was introduced to me. And that was praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit. And so, Romans 8.26 talks about the Spirit and moans and groans that words cannot express. And the Holy Spirit praying for our infirmities in those times of needs. That's in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.10 says that we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be praying in the Spirit to gain revelation even of God's Word. Because I can make all kinds of stuff up about the Bible. There's all kinds of people who have led people astray using the Bible. And so without the Holy Spirit communicating through us, to us, from God and back to God, we may not get the revelation we need that the Scripture holds for us. Ephesians 6.18 tells us that praying in the Holy Spirit will bring us the things that we need in those times. And so it's the deep crying out to deep. Now, if you don't know about praying in tongues, I'm not trying to make this a whole lesson on praying in tongues. I'm just telling you my experiences. And so when I learned this, and I combined the praying in tongues with the fasting, with the worship, with the word, I found these four weapons that helped me start destroying the things in my life that the enemy had tried to use to take me down. And that's mainly what I want to tell you right now. These weapons, the word, the worship, the praying, the fasting, all of these things can help us defeat the things in life that the enemy tries to throw at us. It helps us to stand. And that's what it says in Ephesians, right? Stand so that when everything is done, you're still standing. And we need these spiritual weapons to fight against the enemy. And you know, as we've all said before, the battle starts here. And that's where we need to apply those weapons most of all. So I hope this means something to you. I hope it draws you to the scripture to start studying it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Get into the word. Study these things for yourself. It will bless you. I guarantee you. Thanks for listening. Go to our website, AtlantaRevivalCenter.com and check us out. Keep listening to us on YouTube and Facebook. Love you guys. Appreciate you. Have a great day.